Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Sagi Brody. Sagi is a thought leader and a CTO at Opti9, a hybrid cloud solution provider in North America. He is an expert in all aspects of the cloud and interconnection industries, specialized in digital revolution, evolution, data recovery, and compliance. Sagi, thank you for coming to our interview today. Thanks for having me, Boris. Happy to be Absolutely. here. Absolutely. It's my pleasure too. Uh, Sagi, could you tell us a short story about your career path? What brought you to where you are right now and what you guys at Opti9 are up to these days? Sure. Um, so I've always been interested um, in, in computers and IT and, and, and um, tinkering with devices and, and PCs. And um, so when I was a teenager, I'd, I'd, I'd break them and then have to fix them and, and all that. And um, when uh, when I was 18, 19, I had an opportunity to really to help help um, create a startup, which was related to web hosting and just sort of hosting websites, which was the late 90s and uh, just sort of right place at right time. And um, that eventually led into us, uh, that was called Web Air and we turned, it turned into a fairly large cloud provider. Um, we were acquired about two years ago, and and we we merged with a few other um, other sort of cloud providers, and now we're called Opti Nine. Um, so I've been doing this for you know about twenty five, almost twenty five years now. And uh, Opti Nine is a, a managed cloud provider, um, and what we do is we take full ownership and accountability of managing our customers' cloud infrastructure on their behalf, and that goes for public clouds like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, as well as private cloud infrastructure as well. We also provide services such as uh, backups as a service and disaster recovery as a service. And we really just manage it and uh, our customers outsource the responsibility and the compliance and the, the risk and security associated with, with, with that complexity to us. Fantastic. So I believe we will have a very thoughtful conversation uh, uh, with some probably actionable tips on the topic, uh, why people are making bad technological uh, assumptions, uh, the pitfalls and how to address them. So uh, probably if we, we can start, you in your career have uh, had a large experience with people making technology decisions and assumptions in, in, in a complex environment. So what what is your kind of observations? Uh, where where uh, what kind of people make uh, most of their mistakes in this uh, uh, area of expertise? Well, I mean, you know, the, the the technology is evolving so quickly, and the terminology is also extremely vague. If you just look at the term cloud. Uh, or managed services. I mean, they they are vague, and and that works in the favor of the vendor. They can they can tune and and redefine these things as, as best they want. Um, and but it's all apples and oranges, right? And I think people make a, a ton of assumptions as it relates to these platforms and services. I mean, I, I think the best one is that people believe if they go and use cloud services or, or software as a service platforms that that you know that, that they are not responsible for security or that their data is secure right? or that they are the data is resilient or backed up a, a good example of that is if you if you use let's say uh, microsoft uh, off, uh, office 365 for your email um you know a lot of people are surprised to hear that there are no backups built into that platform um and the devil's in the detail. Yes, you know Microsoft. In that example, Microsoft is providing resilience and they're providing uh, redundancy, um, but there is no inherent capability to log in and restore your email to what it looked like two or three weeks ago. And so people think, well, I'm just going to go and use the cloud, or I'm going to go and use a, a SaaS product, uh, and then it's going to solve all my problems. And it's not. It's just not the case, unfortunately. Um, some of them might, but you really have to ask the right sorts of questions. Um, the other thing is, as an organization, you might you create certain standards around your or around your security requirements, or around your resilience requirements, or compliance requirements, and then you know do these platforms, do these cloud platforms, do these SaaS platforms, 
um, these websites, do they do they conform to those requirements? You know, and this is a problem because a lot of people think about that those questions after their organization has already started using those platforms, and and they try to you know go and ensure that they meet their requirements after they're using them, and some don't. So that has to be part of the conversation before you pick what what platforms or providers you're going to use. Mm -hmm. So. Uh... In, uh, in in the life of uh, kind of um, uh, what is your main uh, customer uh, uh, CISO, right or who, who is a person uh, with you 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 speak without directly is it a, a CEO or CISO? I would say it depends on on the type of company that we work with. Sometimes it's CIOs, sometimes it's CEOs. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we'll talk to a CISO. Um, I'd say. Most, I'd say mostly it's it's infrastructure and, and tech folks and, um, you know, I, organizations that come to us to consume our services are generally those that have kind of, you know, kind of sat down and, and acknowledged that they don't want to be in the business or they don't have an appetite mm -hmm. to take ownership and accountability from, let's say, for managing their disaster recovery or managing their backups. You know, they made, they, they made a conscious decision that they'd rather hold a vendor accountable to an SLA with a contractual obligation to ensure that if if anything bad happens that we can get their infrastructure up and running and you know in under an hour you know if there's a ransomware attack that we can ensure it does not disrupt their business and so i think that you know what's happening today is that you know the the landscape of IT and that certainly includes cloud and and saas and and networking the landscape is becoming much much more complex. Uh, the definition of what constitutes someone's critical production environment is totally shifting. You know, when all of your data and your applications were sitting in one office somewhere, you know, setting up, let's say, disaster recovery uh, was not terribly difficult. You have point A to point B. But now, as the definition of what's critical and, and production changes to all these platforms, how do you ensure resilience of that? It's very complex. And in general, one of the goals of IT today needs to be to, to push for simplicity. If part of your goal of IT is not trying to make your infrastructure simpler, you're not doing something right. You know, Because the more complex, the harder it is to ensure security, compliance, resilience, uptime. Um, and so one of the ways that you know, obviously you can, you can achieve simplicity is to outsource you know, some of these responsibilities. Um, and to work with a vendor that's had experience doing it. And so yeah, that's that's what we help. And, and by the way, there's plenty of other companies that have huge IT teams and they have an appetite to own it themselves. And that's and that's great too. I think just acknowledging what you want to be responsible for, you know, a lot of people kind of just gloss over that that uh conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those companies that have been uh, uh, uh suffering su have suffered uh, from this uh Incidents in the past, like uh, Target and Capital One, are uh, probably had uh, uh, the managing uh, managing uh, services as well. So, what uh, kind of uh, um, you can uh, say uh, as dis distinguish your company from uh, other service providers, and uh, what are some some examples of your best uh, uh, customer cases, uh, use cases? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, going back to the. Uh, I guess assumption, it kind of leading off the assumption questions, you know, th there are many bad, you know, a lot of people have a false sense of security, you know, from and, and look look at the CEO level or look at the non-technical folks, they they might think, well, we have backups. So, so you know, so, so we can restore from a, a cyber attack, a ransomware attack, or we have a disaster recovery scenario. So we can, we can recover. But a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, they have a false sense of security. You know, it, it, you know, the devil's in the details. If you look at um, in the U.S., we had the Colonial Pipeline um, ransomware event about a, a little bit over a year ago, and uh, some people are surprised to hear that they actually had a full backup of all of their data. It wasn't a, a data problem. It was, it was getting their systems back up and running. And the last thing you want to do is restore over what's been hacked because then you lose your forensic capability. And so, I, you know, people really need to understand. What types of events are we prepared to recover from? Um, and what are those scenarios? And do we have runbooks for them? Um, but to answer your question, what do, what do we do different? Well, we try to acknowledge those those scenarios and and deal with them head on. You know, we we are 
going back to the backup and disaster recovery example, you know, that's our core, that's one of our core businesses. But we realized a lot of people were coming to us to consume those services because they were they were mindful of security. Um, and we also re we also noticed out in the field that the attackers are getting smarter. And when they when they get into an organization's IT environment, the attackers are looking for the backup and disaster recovery tools because you know, they want to get paid the ransom. So what the first thing they try to do is delete all the backups and destroy the disaster recovery sites. Um, so we thought, well, what can we do about that? You know, uh, and we realized that if an attacker gets into these tools, they can actually destroy the, the DR site in seconds. Um, so uh, about six months ago, we launched a tool called Observer um, and it's unique in that it's, lo it's specifically looking for that type of scenario. Um, you know, because we are hooked into our customers' backups and DR tools, we have an interesting vantage point. So we're looking for specific human behavior within those tools that are suspicious, that might indicate that someone is in the environment and is about to launch an attack. And so let's say somebody disabled, you know, some backups or removed encryption off a backup or changed the retention policy, all these different types of events, we're looking for them. And if and when we detect them, what we're doing is we can automatically air gap our customers' disaster recovery or offsite backup. So I think that's one of the interesting things that sets us apart. In fact, the industry is sort of you know champion what we did there. Um, and so you know we, we try to be nimble and um, and be responsive to the conditions of the market. And this is something that's you know it's an attack surface that no one's even looking at. Yeah, yeah, interesting point. I Actually, we had an interview with uh, another guy from a managing service provider a few weeks ago, yeah. And he also described that uh, uh, his uh, kind of uh, ability to be nimble is very important. So I, I would like to ask you a personal, uh, your personal point of view. What is the commonly held belief or uh, major misconception in your field of uh, cloud security that you are kind of uh, strongly disagree with? Um. Well, I mean, it's some some people. I I would say that you, you need to have a. That's a that's a good question. I haven't thought about that in a while. But what do I strongly disagree with? Well, I mean, some people think that that they're actually secure, right? And I think one of the big points with security is is really the, the human aspect. You know, the the social engineering. Um, not everything you know can be automated, and I think looking at at you know human behavior within the organization is, is a leading indicator of what's going on or what or what could happen. Um, I also think that people think that they if they contract with a security vendor, like a managed security service provider, that that they're covered for security. Um, they only cover proactive detection prevention. There is no security vendor out there that's going to guarantee a hundred percent that you're not going to be hacked. Mm -hmm. um, you need a, you need a full umbrella protection for cyber. And that includes re reactive capabilities, responsive capabilities. You need a disaster recovery um, um, strategy. If, if, and when you do get hacked, you know, the, the preventative is not enough. And so I think that, Organizations sometimes don't realize that you need a holistic approach, and not only do you need both sides of of the fence, but you need them working together. You need them integrated. You need your security vendor and your disaster recovery vendor to be to be doing incident response together as a team. Um, and so, I, I guess you know, I, I think a lot of people are just checking boxes. We have a security vendor, we're good. But again, they're not going to guarantee one hundred percent. So, what happens if and when? You know, what happens at what is your solution if and when? And I think that the best way that I can describe this is a lot of people tell me, well, we have a DR plan, you know, or we we have, you know, we have a mitigation plan. And I say, okay, well, what if you get hit with ransomware tomorrow? You know, what is what is less painful for you as an organization? Paying a few hundred thousand dollar ransomware or hitting the button on your, you know, deep perceived DR strategy. And a lot of them, it's less painful to pay the ransom because it's more of a guarantee, unfortunately. Like they don't know, like they never tested their strategy. They don't have an actual strategy, you know? So if, so if you wouldn't, if you don't have the confidence to implement that plan, then you don't really have a good DR plan or a good DR strategy. Yeah, fantastic. So 
Uh, where do you think that uh, cloud security as a whole is heading? Uh, what are the trends in the industry and what uh, should we expect uh, from you guys in the future? Um, uh, you know, what's, trend what's trendy right now is observability, um, and, 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 uh, which really is predicated on anomaly detection using machine learning and artificial in intelligence to, which is what we're doing with what I, what we built, I mentioned before, but it's, it's more of an industry trend. Um, the, the complexity has increased to such, to such a point that you can't just receive random alerts at random times. There's too many, there's too much noise. There's too many systems. Um, and there's too much complexity. You need a layer of artificial intelligence to consume all of that information to understand what's the baseline, what's normal for my organization. Maybe getting 30 alerts regarding, you know, specific failures is normal if for, for, you know, during the course of a week. But the artificial intelligence has to sit above all of that and, um, and look at how these different anomalies are occurring in different parts of your environment and make a decision as to how anomalous and suspicious it is. And that those are the alerts that you should be consuming. And you're seeing this with a lot of tooling today. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. there are numerous uh, tools and services available uh, today to bring uh, uh, cybersecurity in house, you said, and uh, some people uh, outsource it. Uh, so how can uh, CISO determine uh, what capabilities should be in house and what should be outsourced? Yeah, good question. I mean, again, I think it just comes down to acknowledging what do I want to be responsible for? If an organization is large enough to have a, a, a CISO and, and potentially a security team, then my recommendation, you know, they they, they have that appetite, right? They, they are fine going into Home Depot and building and buying different puzzle pieces and putting them together. And so they should be looking for best in breed individual vendors to handle different layers of the security landscape um, and sort of and, and sort of own a strategy of how they interact. Um, for them, I would say, you know, don't don't pigeonhole yourself, you know, don't buy one security tool that does five things, because what happens when it does one of those things bad? Now you have to re replace the whole tool, build a flexible model, a reference architecture that allows you to mix and match and replace individual best and breed components um, so that you can you can make sure everything's working properly. Now for smaller organizations that might not have a security team or or even a CISO, that's where the that's where the managed provider comes in. You know, and that's where you need to go wider than going deeper on an individual layer. It's better that you get as much full coverage and wide coverage as you can um, if if you don't have that in-house team. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, for example, if we summarize uh, our interview today, what uh, if someone who is listening to this uh, interview would like to walk away with one or two major uh, takeaways? What, what would that be? I would say, just going back to the, the assumption part, who, whoever, you know, think about these cloud vendors and all these SaaS platforms if you're using Salesforce, if you're using QuickBooks Online, if you're using Workday, um, if you're using Azure or Office 365 email, whatever it is, even cloud providers, um, don't make any assumptions about what, what, what they're beholden to from a responsibility perspective. Um, you know, they, they all have shared responsibility models and it comes down to really a racing matrix, you know, and there's going to be aspects of the security of the data and the resilience um, and compliance that you will retain responsibility for long term. And so understand what you are responsible for and what the vendor is responsible for. Too many people run into situations where they don't know that until after something happens. And then, you know, they're saying, well, I thought, oh, I thought you guys handled that. I thought you were responsible. Understand that now beforehand. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, uh, I uh, would like to finish uh, this interview, but before that, I, I want to ask, ask you a question that I ask all my guests, uh, because uh, as a, um, uh, we are a community of uh, risk managers, uh, global risk community, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, from your opinion, how we can, uh, how can we contribute better to this, uh, uh, to understanding of this complex world of risk from uh, a community perspective? Um, well, I'm, I would say a lot of it comes down to, comes down to technology. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, 
I, I think these days complexity is the killer. And all of the, all of the decisions that not only the IT department, but the, the individual business units are making around technology, you know, is related, is related to potential risk. Um, and so how, how can you guys do a better job? Um, I would say that you need to, you, you need to hold all of the business units accountable to certain risk standards and requirements that they must, you know, be beholden to prior to them making business decisions around platforms that they're going to be using um, or vendors that they're going to be using. And I know it, it sounds oversimplified, but what we see is, you know, development teams and others, you know, sort of just use platforms for testing and then those end up becoming production critical, you know, components. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Saki, that's where all my questions. Perhaps uh, you would like to add something spe specific uh, to our audience that I, I, I missed uh, asking you or forgot to ask you. Um, sure. I mean, I would just say that, you know, um, it, it's really a hybrid world today um, from, a, from a cloud perspective. There is no one best platform. Um, you know, it, it, some, sometimes people ask me, what's the best cloud, you know, for me to use? And it's like, well, what's your use case? What are your requirements? You know, there, if anybody says this cloud's better than that cloud, they, they don't have a good understanding. And so to me, more important than, you know, selecting one platform over the other is helping organizations build a reference architecture where they can consume multiple clouds and multiple platforms in a way that does not break their standards for security and compliance and risk. And there are ways to do that. A lot of it has to do with the network. That That's what connects everything. But there are ways to allow you to consume cloud services and make it look and feel and act like it's part of your local environment. And so, you know, think hybrid. Think what does that flexible model for IT and networking look like? Because then you'll have flexibility to mix and match platforms as they pair up to your use cases. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. I think we we have done a lot of uh, uh, question and answering. Uh, you have a good uh, uh, kind of uh, model uh, for uh, and people people know about your co company. Uh, so uh, where did people people come uh, to see to see your kind of it's opti nine right dot com or something like this? It is yeah opti nine tech dot com, and um, as I said before, we 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 provide full ownership and accountability for managed cloud private cloud, compliance cloud, air gaps cloud, AWS, as well as we do everything when it comes to taking full ownership of backups and DR. And so we typically work with risk managers and our customers existing security vendors so that holistically as a team, we can take full ownership of, of DR and uh, you know incident response. All right, Sagi, I wish you and your company uh, great success and uh, continuing growth with this um... A very, uh, very kind of advancing uh, <laughs> discipline. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.